Greetings and welcome to the five minute major from hockey wanderlust. I am Rob Simpson in Vancouver. That is Ken Yaffe in New York. And that down yonder is Nick Kiprios in Toronto, Ontario. Good morning, gentlemen. Simmer, Ken, how are you? Kipper, great to see you. Happy to get you off the golf course for 10 minutes with a five minute major here. And I'm uh, really excited to, uh, to chat with you. I've known you a long time and, and uh, we'll, we'll get into some of those stories in a minute. Yeah, uh, we're, no, we're, good, we're, good to be here. We're, we're going to talk about all things Europe, obviously, because we're the <laughs> European hockey newsletter. You're not European, but I'm sure you have a few opinions along the way. And you've, uh, and you've played with a handful. I, I, my first question is, do you speak Tekanese? First of all, uh, Europe, my... Greece, hello, yep. immigrant parents. Yep. Uh, I, I definitely have a, a flair for uh, for uh, the immigrant side. Uh, still living it day to day with my parents, eighty seven and eighty respectively. They're doing well. Nice. Still, still home good cr- Greek meals on the table every once in a while. So uh, I, I can relate for sure. Actually, I want to pick up on that, Kipper. So wh- tell me what it was like. You, you, you grew up in the 70s, immigrant parents. Uh, how important was hockey as a kid in terms of your assimilation into Canadian culture? Well, uh, I think for the most part, I, I just kind of led from how it usually works. And that uh, is uh, uh, something that you pick up uh, from your parents. My dad, again, immigrated as a teenager from Greece. So the only ice he knew was in his drinks. Yet he came over and fell in love with the game of hockey right away from, mm-hmm. from the moment he saw it on a, on a black and white television. And uh, I'd watch him watch the games and I'd watch how excited he would get. And uh, I picked up on that vibe. Uh, he'd often tell me stories about walking past Maple Leaf Gardens on his way to work uh, during a hockey game. And he can feel the rumbling of, of the crowd. Hmm. And uh, that just uh, sent, you know, uh, shivers, you know, when I heard that. And I, I can remember some of my earliest memories of, Dad, please take me to a hockey game. I want to go see it. Uh, and, of course, tickets in Toronto, uh, and Simmer, you know this, have always been high in demand. doesn't matter if the Leafs are Stanley Cup champions of the 60s or they absolutely stink in the 80s. It was always a very difficult ticket. So uh, when I when I first walked into Maple Leaf Gardens, it was one of those Wizard of Oz, Oz moments where life is black and white until you see the true colors of those seats in Maple Leaf Gardens, and and my world changed. Now, and then, of that, course, you had a chance to play there. Did, did that modify? Did that modify the whole bias that we grew up with? Because we're in the same, all the same age group. So you always just hear the anti-European this and Boris Salman getting abused, and oh, the Swedes can't do this and that, and then the Russians. Um, did that alter that oh. for you? Oh no, no, not at all. It just enhanced it. It just made me love the sport even more. And you know, when you talk about that whole European transformation to the NHL. Uh, I feel it, it's, it's part of my life, part of my culture. I could feel every hit that Boreas Salming took, every mm. punch, every taunt, every um, bullying scenario that the Philadelphia Flyers threw at him. I, I could feel uh, just by watching the game on TV. And what you felt even more was the resilience of Borea Salming to say, I will not be bullied. I will not back down. And it was phenomenal uh, to watch and really helped me shape early of how passionate hockey players are all over the world. I mean, we always thought Canada owned the game, uh, but Borea Salming really introduced uh, to us um, that there's, talent coming all over the world to the National Hockey League. Uh, Outside of the 72 series with Russia, it was us against them. You know, when Borea came from Sweden, it was, hey, he may not be Canadian, but we're adopting him. Yep, absolutely. Kipper, you you had a chance to play uh, with a number of of Europeans over the course of your career. You and I go back to 94, uh, little-known hockey Story. I was actually your neighbor. 
Um, the night you won the cup with the Rangers, uh, I shared a wall. I wasn't invited to the party, but we were <laughs> friends and neighbors. And you kept me up all night. You were roommates with Brian Noonan. Noonan. And, uh, we, we, we were literally next door neighbors. And, and, and that's how long we go back. Um, Holy jeez! You don't know how to crash a party, Ken. At that point, yeah, I, was probably, I, I think I was, I, I was. I was drunk beyond belief, man. You could have been there. You could have taken yeah, the I cup had the for New all York I know. Post calling me, they wanted to come in. They wanted to get access to the building so they could cover it. I, I was going to say because no. he, he mastered party crashing later. Like what the yeah, hell? No. <laughs> yeah. um, so you, you played uh, you around some great Europeans. I mean, that team uh, peeking in, you, you know, you played with Curry. What, what were um, some of the, uh, I guess, the, the lessons you learned from, from your exposure? You, you mentioned as a kid the influence of Borea Salming, and then as you got yeah. into the game, um, what, are, what are some of the memories you have and some of the influences that you had? Well, well I always enjoyed my, uh, my European teammates because it gave me a chance to – uh, hear about culture growing up that wasn't uh you know um typical and you know whether it was the swedes the Finns, you know the russians sitting at dinner and, and hearing how they grew up was an education in itself and you know the one thing i loved about my new york teammates is uh they were all great guys so proud uh that the first russians in NHL history to win the Stanley cup came from our 94 team with Kovalev, uh, you know, Zuboff and Nchinov, you know, Karpatsov, yeah, right. The God bless his soul. Yeah. Uh, we lost, uh, in a tragic, uh, plane accident, uh, in the KHL. Yeah. Um, but those guys weren't scared to, uh, talk about their history, to talk about, uh, their upbringing and how difficult it was and, how it was a way for them to get out. Um, and here we are, you know, we treated it as, as, a, as a hobby to start, right? Um, a passionate one, but one that, uh, you know, we treated like anything else. And, and yet they, they had established really early in their lives that uh, it, was, it was a possible out for them, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the past history of, of their families. So uh, I loved every single minute of it. Uh, some of my best friends still are, are, are you know, uh, players on that Ranger team. Although we don't talk daily anymore, it's as if we never have been apart uh, once we pick up conversations. But, you know, those, um, those Russians, uh, Alex Kovalev, possibly the most talented player I've ever played with. And, and a fun guy, great sense of humor. Uh, I recall him coming to practice as many nights with uh, his lips swollen. And I'm like, buddy, were you in a fight last night? And he's like, no, I'm learning how to play the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he blew so hard that all these blood vessels had broken all around his mouth. And I'm like, Who's the guy that punched you last night? Tell me, I'll go get him. That's fantastic. Going to play in a jazz club. My, one of my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite trivia questions of any team is the fact that Sergei Zuboff led the '94 Rangers in scoring in the regular season. The defenseman. I think that's. Hey, simmer, yeah. simmer, and he started in the minors. It's crazy. Okay, he didn't even start the season with us. Keenan was so pissed off at him. He sent them down to Binghamton for about a week. And then it's like, are you nuts? Get this guy back up here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, can, before we move off the Rangers, you're, you're forever a Ranger. Uh, you have your name on the cup, uh, remarkable uh, journey with that team. Um, give us one Mark Messier anecdote, just a, a quick one. I know there's many. Oh, just uh, the initial feeling I had when I first uh, uh, walked into the New York Ranger dressing room and there was Mark greeting you uh, with tremendous sincerity. And at that point, he was already a legend, right? He's already won his five Stanley Cups uh, with the Edmonton Oilers and he's won his MVPs. And now it's just about, you know, slaying this 54 year old dragon uh, in New York without a championship. But uh, 
about two weeks into it, he takes me out for lunch and we're having this conversation. And uh, I'm like, Mark, you've got five Stanley cups. Uh, and I've, I've never seen you wear your ring yet. And I'm like, if, if I had five, I'd be wearing them on all my fingers and I probably have one pierced between my, <laughs> my nostrils. And uh, he says to me, uh, so I asked him, why don't you wear, why don't you wear any of them? He says, well, why don't you wear yours? And I'm like, well, I think maybe he's teasing me now. I'm like, I don't have one. And he goes, I, I know you don't have one, but I'll make you a deal. I'll, I'll wear mine when you can wear yours. And I'm right. like, oh, that's a deal. <laughs> that's a deal. If anybody knows how to win these things, it's you. I'm going to get a ring. That's when I really said to myself, holy shit, man, I'm going to get a ring. Because uh, this guy, this guy knows how to do it. Yeah. He's not screwing around. No. We should think, acknowledge uh, the you came over from Hartford. Rod Gilbert. Uh, just before we move off the Rangers as well. And, oh, yeah. and Rod, Rod was a heart and soul. And, and I know uh, was a staple ar around the garden in his retirement it, as early as 94. Uh, he probably barely missed a game, probably attended a lot of practices and, and uh, is, is uh, as iconic a figure as there is in that organization. And, and we'll all miss Rod. Yeah, Ken, very well said. And I just spoke about the presence that Mark, I felt right away. The, the other presence when I walked in and, and was traded to the New York Rangers was Rod. And Rod, of course, a tremendous ambassador, worked for the Rangers all these years. Uh, but uh, he, he was Mr. New York Ranger, always will be, as great as the Leech, Leech and the Messiers and the Richters uh, from that 94 Cup team. He will always be 18 season, our, a our, 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 our Mr. Ranger. But, you know, the one thing that was – so clear from the moment I got traded there was his genuine sincerity as a human being. And, and that included wanting us to do well, you know, and sometimes when players get traded or their careers don't end the way they'd like, or they didn't win a championship, uh, there'd be scenarios where, you know, there might be some animosity, some jealousy, this guy from day one, felt like when we won, he won himself. And that's not an easy thing to do when you know you're, you're not getting your name on the Stanley Cup. But whether it was, when Rod really led the charge for all uh, alumni, New York Rangers, who started really, you know, after the first and second round, started really, you know, coming around. And, you know, when you walk into the dress room before a big game, um, and you see the likes of Rod there, and now you're seeing, uh, you know, Dugay and, you know, Eddie Jackman started getting involved again. It was like, wow, man, we're not only just doing it for the Ranger fans, we're doing it for everybody that wore this uniform yeah. that may have come this close, but couldn't get it done. And Rod led that charge. Uh, phenomenal. Still their leading goal and point uh, scorer, by the way, for the Rangers organization. Hey, let, let's go. Let's jump over to some current events and talk a little bit about the Olympics, because obviously that's uh, very Eurocentric in a large way because of the, the international nature of it. Obviously, it's it's every time we go through the same thing. Oh, my God, are we going? Owners don't want to go. Players want to go. Blah, blah, blah. They just signed a little bit of a deal, getting some insurance from the IIHF and the IOC. I mean, from a player's perspective and from your perspective now, um, what do you think I mean, about this Beijing thing? Well, I, I agree with you, Simmer, that we, we seem to be chasing our, our tail or, or just spinning in the mud. Uh, but it, it'll never our, – our international um, – our international competitions should be the leading charge of all major sports. When you think about it, when you think about the influence that we have out of Europe, uh, how are we not the leaders in international play? And yet uh, here we are to your point. Some want to go, some don't want to go. Gary doesn't want to go. Now you hear some of the NHL PA, um, you know, People outside of the players don't want to go either, but the players do. 
And it's, it, it can't be successful unless we're all on the same page. And I don't understand. And, and of course, now the issues now are COVID. And if you, ca- if you catch it and you, you know, uh, your contract may not be guaranteed. And of course, as much love and passion you have for competition, uh, nobody steps on the ice until the business side is looked after. And yet here we are, and, and nobody really knows for sure what this means in terms of a business side. And, you know, maybe some of the things that were promised before I uh, hear that uh, maybe not be quite etched in stone, like how many highlights you can show, uh, how much of the, of the rings can you use in your marketing and the websites. So it, it's, it's very disappointing, Simmer, to hear all of this. Yet, yet it's you know, familiar. It's familiar, Kipper, right? Because it's the same. It's been the same story. I, I was close to it, as you know, for for decades. It's been the same story. There's yeah. always been sort of a, a thread of uncertainty, and 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 the thing that I worry about the most, because I agree with you 100, percent and I I made it uh, my business to 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 drive that international competition as a you know, as a key business driver for a global plan to grow the business of the league. Um, and, and, and yet there was always a strand of uncertainty around the Olympics. And I think the constant drip, drip, drip of uncertainty starts to sound like, well, maybe it really isn't that important. And, and the impressions that you make are really the only thing you have in this business, right? We're, 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 we're trying to, you know, to, to promote something constantly as, as well, frankly, being more important than it is. They're just games at the end of the day. We make them important. We bring patriotism and a global platform, international platform into it. So I, I worry about that um, constant uncertainty and whether people ultimately start to lose interest. Well, we got to fix this right away because our, our, best, our best moments ever in international play is now like 30, 40, 50 years old. That's not a good thing. There's a whole generation here and they need to go to archives to see the best moments, whether it is the summit series, whether, you know, uh, here in Canada, it was Daryl Sittler's, uh, you know, 76 game winning goal against Czechoslovakia, whether it was the U S over Russia in, in Lake Placid, uh, and then we got into the 90s, and then, you know, we had some great moments there, too, with the USA in the World Cup of Hockey in 96, led by Mike Richter. But where has it gone since, right? Well, you get, a, you, like, get an argument, you get an argument from the folks in Vancouver about 2010 and Sidney Crosby. You know what? Yeah, <laughs> listen. No, no, no. But, but, but we're, I know we're what talking, you mean. We're talking about one. One, yeah. One, one. in 20 years. And the U.S. Yeah. hasn't, U.S. Uh, had 96 was incredibly, was incredible. And it was violent. It was violent. incredible. It was violent. Incredible. And, but, it, but eight, eight, 1980, that's 41 years ago. That, that's yeah, yeah, I mean, listen, so listen, yeah. it, it's just not a constant now. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I was, I loved Sid's goal. Um, but you like know, you it's out, just, it's not, it's not there one, right. one in 20 years. And then wh- where's the world cup. Okay. Tell me that we're, we're, tell me from a business perspective that the Olympics make no sense for the NHL owners who are the gatekeepers of, of, of the league. They own it. They, they run it. I get it. I get it. You don't yeah. see enough upside from just going in and participating and shutting down your business. I get it. It's not a direct line to the PNL, Kipper. That's it. It's not a direct line, but there there is residual value there, right? Maybe it can carry maybe, over the maybe. globe. A, a single moment, the patriotism. You know, you, that's what you hope for. You can't have a miracle on ice every four years in the Winter Games. It, it doesn't work that way. In the same way that you can't have the Olympics in Vancouver or yes. Salt Lake every four years because it's convenient for the NHL's marketing plan and yeah. the players' travel and yeah. everything else. It's not their but, event. So you got there's but, a give and a take. But there is a downside for owners and managers too. And you, you, you know, you know what that that Olympic lag effect can do to a room, can do to momentum that a team may have, can lead to injuries and other things. And so that you know, there there's a risk. 
So and outside of the risk in a COVID year. So outside of similar COVID to his point on, on Sid's game winning goal, World Cups off, on, yeah, off, yeah. come it's back. Joke. joke. Nobody. You know, it, it, it is. And and the vibe, the vibe isn't 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 uh, strong in the World Cup because the vibe isn't coming from a, a place where um, we're talking of strength. We're talking weakness here. It's almost as if World Cups are like a plan B and, right. and people don't people necessarily aren't buying it, especially they, when you don't commit to it. Right. And they feel manufactured. There's just no way around it where the yeah. Olympics are the Olympics and it's that it has the tradition and the history and you understand why guys are into it, where the World Cups are so sporadic and so manufactured yeah. that it just does, it doesn't have the same feeling. So, so we, we, we can't cover 32 teams, now 32 teams in the National Hockey League. It's, it's actually, I got to get used to saying that. Um, but in a couple of minutes, Kipper, um, in your view, who had a good summer? Who looks better coming into training camp? And um, assuming we're going to see it, 82 game slate of games. What looks interesting heading into this season? Well, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I look at the New Jersey Devils and the forgotten kind of uh, once proud Stanley Cup, Lou Lamarillo, Brodeur, right? Nita Meyer, Scott Stevens. I mean, you look at them the last few years and they've been a forgotten organization. Unfortunately, P.K. Subban has not been able to go there and, and light it up and, and, and create a lot of attention or momentum for them. But then they turn around and give one of the biggest contracts to Dougie Hamilton. And I, it was a statement, uh, no question, by their ownership group. Uh, and we'll see where it takes them. I mean, that's a high-risk high signing, but he's, he's, he's turned himself into a top defenseman. And uh, I, I like it. I, I do. I think it creates a lot of energy there. And, and, and New, New Jersey has to do it. You can't just get, keep be, getting buried by the New York Rangers, you know, with, uh, with all the attention. Uh, that's a signing that can, can do it. No question about it. And then, you know, I'm kind of local here in Toronto. So the big story there was uh, losing Zach Hyman, a meat and potatoes type of guy. Leafs painted themselves in a corner with four uh, huge contracts way above market value at the time. Of course, they thought that the cap would keep going up. That didn't happen. And now there's a lot of upset people, but a few happy ones in Edmonton with uh, a very hardworking uh, Zach Hyman uh, riding shotgun now with Connor McDavid. So it could be more of the same from the Leafs. Um, you're an author. Uh, you, you wrote the book Undrafted. Uh, you tell a, a lot of your stories there, and, and it's a great read. And, and we uh, certainly uh, uh, encourage uh, our listeners to, to, uh, to take it. I guess it can't be on the summer reading list anymore, but you can move it over to the autumn reading list. Um, and uh, you're uh, a face, an insider in the game, 20-plus years as a commentator following your NHL career in Canada. Uh, and, and now you're an entrepreneur uh, and you've built a business called Little Buddha, which uh, based on my mention of the name and your reaction there, nonverbal cues, you're as excited about that as anything that you've done in, in your hockey career. Tell us a little bit about Little right, Buddha by, and how you sort of landed on the business. By, by the way, I have one right here, but it, it is five o'clock somewhere. And uh, <laughs> I'm keeping it off camera. I'm keeping it off Thanks, camera. Sir. For breakfast. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ken, you know, for me, when I started uh, looking at maybe taking a, a year off of broadcasting after uh, 21 years, hmm. I, I needed a project that had nothing to do with hockey. I had to kind of show that I can take all of those life lessons I've learned on and off the ice and apply it to something totally different. So my wife and I thought about, uh, you know, forming a partnership with uh, family friends and starting a, a beverage company. And these drinks outside of beer and alcohol uh, seem to be trending uh, in, in, a, in a great direction that people wanted alternatives and uh, we decided to do a, an RTD, which stands for ready to drink in a can. 
Of course, you've seen the white claws out there taking the world by storm. Uh, we decided to do one that would check off a list that we'd like in a drink. And uh, that included, uh, first and foremost, uh, organic ingredients of the highest quality, uh, no sugar, uh, under 100 calories, gluten-free, no preservatives. And uh, we said, let's, let's go for it. So, you know, we knew nothing about the industry. We knew nothing about how to uh, start. So what do we do? Well, we do what 7 billion other people do. They go to Google, right? <laughs> <laughs> how do you buy cans, right? How do you, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you start uh, um, a, 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 a profile on taste, all of that. And, uh, you know, we stuck with it. My wife is now running the company on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, uh, our partner, uh, uh, Kim, and they're doing a fantastic job. And we're in our second year. We started uh, in the LCBO here in Ontario. LCBO is one of the biggest alcohol buyers in the world over 650 stores just in Ontario. We started out with a, a grilled pineapple and rosemary uh, vodka uh, cocktail. And now we've got a peach tea. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, we're talking to a few people. Maybe we'll be in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, we've got our fingers crossed uh, fairly soon on a, on a soft launch. Well, and I think that I think your story comes full circle when we see little Buddha on a rink board at an NHL <laughs> rink as a sponsor. Yeah. Your Kipper, what so media wise, you brought up to 21 years. What are you what's the plan? What are you doing? What's moving ahead? We had the real we had real Kipper. Yeah. Had, what's happening? What do we well, what do we do? Yeah, Simmer, you know, uh, it was important for me after 21 years to just take uh, a little bit of time off. But um, and I've been able to do that. Um, I'm so blessed that uh, I was able to kind of take a step back, didn't know the pandemic was coming, but it was uh, a, a good uh, scenario for me to be home uh, every night with my, uh, with my family during it. Uh, but I was able to keep my toe in the water a little bit by, uh, by signing on with uh, a gaming company called i3. They gave me my own show called Real Kipper at Noon, which um, please, I... Uh, if you want to pick up, uh, um, go to my YouTube channel, uh, linemovement.com. Uh, you'll be able to find it and see some great segments I had. I was able to uh, get together with Doug McLean. Uh, I've known Doug for a long time. Of course, famous uh, uh, president, general manager, uh, starting up Columbus Blue Jackets. So we's had, we've had so much fun. Uh, but now we're in a scenario where... Uh, we're going to continue in, in some direction, at least. Uh, uh, I don't know whether or not it'll be with I3. We're still into talks, uh, but you know, I'm going to I'm going to get back into it. I, I loved the the podcast. I love uh, the ability to kind of uh, unlike TV, right, where you can just really talk and have some great conversations like we've had in the last what 20, 25 minutes. I love that part of it. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come up with something by September, October, and uh, I want to continue to have some fun. But uh, it's a good pace for me. TV's hectic. I like being home at nights. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens next in, in the next couple of weeks, but I'll keep you guys abreast. Our, our, third, your, partner, your... our third partner in Stockholm, Risto Pekarainen, who you might have met or know, he is a religious watcher follower of that podcast. So just so you know. Oh. Great. And, and, great as Ken, no. and as Ken says goodbye and thanks you, and I thank you, of course, I'm going to just get something off screen here to just remind people product branding. Go ahead, Ken. Kipper, your, your voice in the game is an important one. We, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to get your insights and, and always to hear your stories. Many more can be found in, in, in your book, Your Journey to the NHL and Undrafted. And uh, we, we will um, for sure keep in touch and uh, maybe bring you back in, in during training camp when oh, there's the little Buddha <laughs> arriving on screen. R on rub cue. it, rub it for luck. <laughs> that looks like go. the big Buddha. Kemper. It is a big Buddha. It's like a, it's like a freaking thirty pounder. <laughs> yeah. there little we go. Buddha, baby. There and it Buddha's is. Looks like he's been doing about the same number of push-ups that I have. That 
It's all those positive vibes, right? I'll never forget it. Yeah. We'll let you get out on the golf. Thanks, course. Kipper. Just enjoy enjoy these last few days of summer. We'll talk to you during training camp. All right, uh, Ken Simmer, uh, my pleasure, and, and we'll do it again real soon. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you.